Good afternoon and welcome. You have joined us for the 2019 Annual Supreme Court Review and Preview. My name is Caitlin McCarthy and I'm the Director of Education, Associates, and Corporate Partnerships at the Environmental Law Institute. We're delighted to welcome everyone today to the CLI Public Seminar here with Harvard Law School. Thank you for joining us. <coughs> at the end of today's panel, we'll have a few minutes for a question and answer session, and we encourage you to ask your questions at that time. If you're joining us via GoToWebinar, please enter your questions through GoTo's question box, and please send your questions as soon as you think of them. Do not wait until the end. If you're here in the room, James and I have microphones that we'll bring around for questions at that time. I'd like to start today by thanking Kathleen Crowley, James Pollock, and all of Harvard Law School for helping develop this topic and today's program. I would also like to thank our outstanding panelists, Richard and Jody, for joining us today to lend their leadership to this program. While I'll introduce them briefly momentarily, the full speaker bios are on our website, ELI.org, and I would encourage you to check out their expertise in more detail there. As we begin, I'd like to briefly introduce today's panelists, Jody Freeman. Jody is the Archibald Cox Professor of Law and the founding director of the Harvard Law School Environmental and Energy Law Program. Professor Friedman is a leading scholar of both administrative law and environmental law and has written extensively about climate change, environmental regulation, and executive power. Thank you for being here, Jody. Richard Lazarus. Richard is the Howard and Catherine Engel Professor of Law at Harvard University, where he teaches environmental law, natural resources law, Supreme Court advocacy, uh, courts, and much more. Professor Lazarus's primary areas of legal scholarship are environmental and natural resources, uh, with a particular emphasis on constitutional law and the Supreme Court. Richard said, London here. With that, I will turn things over to Dr. Crown. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for yay. Thank, uh, thank you all for being here. Many of you are in our classes now. We're in our classes. We'll be in our classes. Uh, we're really excited to see you all and everybody who's joining by webinar. Uh, welcome. This is a terrific event for us and fun for us to do together. We have so much interesting material to cover. We're going to dive right in. Richard will start by giving us some overview trends, and then we'll start talking about individual cases from the past term, and then we'll look forward to see what we have in store coming for this term. Richard. All right, great. So let's go to the court. Uh, we're going to uh, basically go right inside uh, the court, uh, go right in the front doors, and, and there they are. Uh, so it was a big year for the Supreme Court, October term 18, we'll talk about first. This is a court in transition. Uh, this is a court trying to find a new equilibrium. We got two new justices added in two years. Uh, that's a lot. Uh, it's a working conservative majority now uh, with Justice Kennedy's absence, a conservative justice, but someone who uh, could sometimes swing both ways. And one of the big issues when the court opened its term a year ago was how far they would go and how quickly, uh, with some surprising results. Uh, here are, of course, the two new justices, and the question was sort of what, what were they going to do? Um, and how far right, to some extent, would the, would the court swing? Uh, so here's an interesting statistic. This is the year before. This is October term 2017, not the one that just completed. If you look to that year, if you look to the, the sort of 5-4 votes, the closely divided cases, you can see that Robert Thomas, Alito Thomas, plus Eder Kennedy, uh, I think uh, in 17, sorry, this is 17, uh, you had 74% of them were red, conservative. Uh, and 26% was some other lineup. Uh, so uh, the year before this, most completed one, the conservatives really ran the table, uh, 76, uh, 74 to 26. Look at the term that was just ended, uh, the one just ended, uh, completely different. Uh, you see 45% of the time, uh, you've got uh, basically the liberals, more liberals, got one of the others to join them. So in the closely divided cases, 45% of the five fours uh, went, you call it blue, uh, only 35% uh, was that sort of conservative 5-4 line of people thought would run a juggernaut through the term, and 20% was, was other. So it's a very different uh, result than people expected. And part of it was that Kavanaugh uh, and Gorsuch turned out not to be twins at all in lots of ways. So you can see uh, uh, how it looks here that in, in the non-unanimous cases, uh, Justice Kavanaugh joined Justice Gorsuch 53% of the time in the non-unanimous cases. That was much different than when, how much he joined either Breyer or Kagan. Um, he's not a liberal, but it just shows there was a lot of fragmentation, a lot of interesting things going on uh, last term. It's a court sort of in, in search uh, of itself. Uh, it's also a term where the Chief Justice uh, had to really take charge. Uh, he was now the center of the court. Uh, he's a very conservative person, but he's the center of the court. He's controlling vote in, in lots of, of cases, put a lot of pressure on him. 
Uh, you could, one could see him during the term trying to put the brakes a little bit on the court um, on what kinds of cases they, they grant a review on. And, and a chief justice who's facing a confrontation uh, with the President of the United States. And it really hit the headlines when uh, the chief went out and talked about how there are no Obama judges and Trump judges, but a very hardworking independent federal judiciary. And the President just shot right back. Uh, and so the, the two of them are having to work things out. And obviously, as you may know, the chief ended up presiding over an impeachment trial in the Senate uh, as well uh, in the not too distant uh, future. Uh, some interesting uh, statistics just to think about for the most completed term. Who asked the first question the most? Uh, last term, uh, it was Justice Ginsburg. Uh, so I think that was clearly a, a symbolic statement by her. I'm still here. Uh, I'm still here. I'm active. And I'm, I don't plan to go away any uh, time soon. Uh, in terms of who asked the most questions at oral argument, uh, Justice Sotomayor uh, asked the most questions, which is significant for a, a relatively junior uh, justice uh, on the court. Ginsburg, you see, was lowest, but she's asking uh, that first one. Uh, and then who authored opinions the most? And that's majority concurring dissenting. So who's writing the most? Uh, and you can see it's Justice Thomas. Uh, I always like to emphasize that because people um, overestimate the significance of the fact he doesn't ask questions. Uh, he is very highly engaged. He works very hard. He writes more opinions than anybody else. He writes far more pages by about 50% uh, than many of the justices on the court. Don't underestimate Justice Thomas. Don't underestimate his significance on the court. And it's increasing uh, now, not decreasing. On to the cases from last term. The very first case argued last term was the Weyerhaeuser case, which concerned a challenge to the Fish and Wildlife Service's designation of critical habitat for the endangered dusky gopher frog, which sounds like that. Uh, the, the Fish and Wildlife Service had designated as part of the frog's critical habitat not just the pond around which the last 100 frog population currently now lives, which happens to be in Mississippi, but also designated some private land in Louisiana where the frog had lived before but hadn't been seen since 1965, <coughs> that private land being owned by the petitioner's warehouser, where they operate a timber farming operation. Uh, and the um, district court had upheld this designation. Uh, the Fifth Circuit had affirmed and said that critical habitat is defined in the Endangered Species Act as essential for conservation. That's what it says. And the act also specifically says that land that's not currently occupied by the species may be designated. So what the Fifth Circuit said was there's no habitability requirement to critical habitat because unoccupied land can be designated as long as it's essential for conservation. Um, the land that Weyerhaeuser owns couldn't currently support the frog. It does have a fantastic and lovely pond where the frog would thrive, but the canopy is too thick at the moment, and it needs sort of open canopy trees. So it would need some modification for the frog to survive. The Chief Justice. Uh, uh, wrote for the court in a unanimous opinion. They had granted cert to consider two things. The first is whether critical habitat must be habitat. Initially a question that boggles the mind, uh, but as you'll soon see, it becomes highly relevant. And secondly, whether in fact um, the decision to designate this habitat after considering the economic impacts on Weyerhaeuser, which could be quite significant, depriving them potentially of millions of dollars because they may not be able to get permits to develop the land and make sort of significant amounts of money using it for other uses if it were designated as critical habitat. Even after considering all that, the service had designated and the Fifth Circuit had said, this is unreviewable. It's discretionary. It's committed to discretion by law. So the Supreme Court was also reviewing that aspect of the decision. Um, in his introduction, in the opinion, the Chief Justice was very sweet about the frog, uh, describing its behavior and how it protects itself when threatened. And this may have been an effort to make up for him having maligned the Port Arroyo toad in the Rancho Viejo case in which he descended from a petition for rehearing on Bonk. Or perhaps he favors the frog over the toad, which <laughs> would be most unfortunate. But it was a very sweet uh, uh, description of the frog and its habits. Um, the court here. Um, basically said, yes, critical habitat must be habitat. They did something quite narrow and then remanded it back to the Fifth Circuit to define what habitat 
means. Why does this matter? Well, there was a very lively oral argument. The court was very interested in what the limits might be on designating unoccupied land that is, quote, essential for conservation. So the Chief Justice put a hypothetical to counsel for Weyerhaeuser and said, um, well, or sorry, counsel for uh, the United States and said, well, you know, what if you put the frog up in Alaska and put a giant greenhouse over it? Could that be critical habitat? Suggesting that he was on the search for a limiting principle. So the question that goes back to uh, the Fifth Circuit is, if critical habitat has to be habitat first, what are the limits of habitat? Does it mean areas that can currently support the species in their current condition without modification? Does it mean areas that once supported the species, that could once again support the species with reasonable modifications? If reasonable, how, what's reasonable? How expensive? What kind of extent to those modifications? So these are the open questions that the Fifth Circuit now has to grapple with. I will also say that the court uh, just did away with this uh, idea that perhaps the decision by the agency here to designate this habitat, even after doing this economic analysis, that that was somehow unreviewable. The court said, we have a strong presumption of judicial review. This is a run-of-the-mill decision, a routine decision that agencies make when they weigh factors and do things. Of course, it's reviewable. Uh, so they disposed of that uh, quite easily. So in a sense, this is very narrow, and it goes uh, back to the Fifth Circuit. We may see the dusky gopher frog uh, again. The Next case um, of relevance to environmental law from last term uh, involves the National Park Service and its management of national parks in Alaska. The National Park Service has a nationwide ban on hovercrafts on waterways in national parks. The National Park Service Organic Act uh, says that conduct on or relating to waters in the national park are subject to jurisdiction by the Park Service. But in the Sturgeon case, the court held that the National Park Service has no authority to regulate navigable waters that are in the national park system in the state of Alaska. This uh, situation arose because John Sturgeon, who is actually not a fish, he is a person. John, John Sturgeon was piloting his hovercraft on the Nation River in the Yukon Preserve, which is part of the Alaska System of Conservation Units, which is in the national park system. It's a complicated land. Uh, and water management system. And the park rangers pulled him over. Uh, uh, I won't get to Justice Kagan quite yet. I'll stick with uh, John Sturgeon. Um, they pulled him over and said, you can't have a hovercraft here. We're the National Park Service. We're the rangers. And it's illegal. And you can't do it. And he was hunting moose from his hovercraft. And he said, you have, this is the guy in the hovercraft. You have no jurisdiction uh, over me here in the Yukon uh, 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 Preserve because the National Park Service uh, authority doesn't apply here. He eventually complied. He pulled over his hovercraft. He stopped hunting his moose. But this case then ultimately went through the Ninth Circuit up the Supreme Court, not once, but twice. This is the second time it reaches the court. And the Ninth Circuit below had held that uh, the Yukon Preserve um, contained the, a river that was public land. So the Nation River on which he was piloting his hovercraft was considered by the Ninth Circuit to be public land. And even if it weren't public land, said the Ninth Circuit, uh, the fact that the United States retained some reserved water rights in the river was enough to support the national interest, the US interest in the river, to support a claim that it was public land. And it therefore was regulable by the National Park Service. Um, the court unanimously rejected this view, rejected the Ninth Circuit's uh, findings, and held that what controls here is an Alaska statute called the Alaska National Interest Land Conservation Act, which is a very complicated statute that Justice Kagan, writing for a majority court, did some wonderful inter close interpretation of. And what she basically explained is that ANILCA does the following. The Alaska statute defines uh, as public land, not just lands, but waters. So there are some public lands, which also means some waters. Uh, however, non-public lands within the Alaska National Park System, so private, state, tribal lands within the National Park System, are not public and are not subject to regulations that are National Park Service rules that apply solely to public lands in the conservation units. So basically, non-public land is exempt. And uh, the reason under ANILCA, under this law, the Supreme Court said that, in fact, the Nation River isn't public land 
uh, is because, and this is the Justice Kagan writing for the court, uh, the reason it's not public land is that, follow me now, when Alaska joined uh, the Alaska Statehood Act, when it joined the Union in 1959, it incorporated the Submerged Lands Act, so the state owns the riverbed, not the federal government. And the fact that the United States retains use rights, that is reserved water rights for the river, is not sufficient to support title because it's uh, only an interest in a certain amount of water. So the river, it turns out, a navigable waterway running through the national park system is non-public land because of the effect of the Alaska statute. Uh, and uh, what Justice Kagan becomes is a hero in Alaska uh, as a result of this decision. And what she says is, uh, Alaska is the exception, not the rule. The opinion for the court says this no fewer than eight times, making it clear that if uh, Mr. Sturgeon had brought his claim in any other state in the Union, he wouldn't have had a prayer of succeeding. And it was important that the court did that because they're trying to limit the impact of withdrawing the National Park Service's jurisdiction over all of this land to the uniqueness of the state of Alaska, which uniquely has this statute. I will say that all, although you could characterize this case as basically, um, you know, primarily now a case about Alaska, Alaska's big. Um, the conservation unit system there that, that I'm describing that contains a mix of lands that is considered part of the national park system is 44 million acres. That is 10% of the state. That is 18 million acres of non-public land over which the Park Service just lost jurisdiction. That's a very significant, significant loss of regulatory power. But it's important to know that the Supreme Court left open the idea that the federal government can still regulate these non-public lands in the national park system in Alaska under the Clean Water Act, under the Endangered Species Act. This exclusion or exemption is about the park service. So he is free, Mr. Sturgeon, to pilot his hovercraft, hunting moose, as is everyone else throughout the state of Alaska. One little note. Nobody, the government did not argue Chevron, did not argue for deference, even though this involved a very complicated statute and its interaction with the National Park Service Organic Act, not a breath about Chevron, which is an interesting uh, observation. Um, if he had been in any other state, he would have lost. Uh, this made Justice Kagan um, an honorary Alaskan of the week. Um, uh, Senator Sullivan uh, named her the Honorary Alaskan in his weekly address. Uh, this is Justice Kagan yep. hunting with... Um, I don't know how that happened, but anyway. Oh, there she is, hunting yeah. with Justice Scalia, which makes her... Right. I, we don't know. Okay. Thank you. The Alaskan of the Year. All right, I'm going to talk it. about the, the Nick V. Township of Scott, uh, Pennsylvania uh, case. This is a regulatory takings case. Um, uh, and regulatory case cases are the bread and butter of environmental law. Um, Every time you bring um, sort of a tough environmental re restriction on the use of land, in particular, people often claim it's unconstitutional taking of the Fifth Amendment, requiring the payment uh, of just compensation. Uh, the issue in Nick, though, was this, and that is whether a landowner who claims that a state or local government has regulated their property so much that it amounts to an unconstitutional taking, whether they have to bring that takings claim in state court, uh, or instead can bring it in federal court in the first instance uh, as a Section 1983 action. Uh, for 35 years, that's been a settled issue. For 35 years, based on a Supreme Court decision called Williamson County, it's been quite clear that the landowner who's bringing a takings claim uh, against state law government could not bring in the federal court. They had to go to state court first. And the rationale of the court was, if you're claiming the state local government has taken your property without just compensation, you first need to find out whether they'll give you just compensation. And that means you've got to go to state court, because if you win, you'll get just compensation. So you can't go to federal court and claim a, a taking without just compensation until you've actually exhausted your remedies under state court to see if you've got one. Uh, in, in this case, uh, the court uh, decided to revisit that issue. Uh, and this has been brewing for quite a long time. Uh, the case was decided five to four with the Chief Justice uh, writing for the court. Uh, and the court basically overruled Williamson County. Uh, they said, that's not fair to make people always go to state court. You have a completed taking before you actually try to exhaust your remedies under, in, in state court. If they've restricted your land and they've done it without offering you just compensation at that moment, it's a regulatory takings claim. It's ripe at that point. Uh, and that means you can go immediately to federal court. Uh, so why is this a big deal? Uh, for a few reasons. One, they overruled a longstanding precedent. And everyone last year was watching for every time the court be willing to overrule anything. 
uh, because of signs they might be rolled over, over other things uh, which are decades uh, in place, and you can use your own imagination to figure out what everyone's thinking about, Roe v. Wade. Uh, <laughs> second, it's a big deal you can now bring these things under Section 1983. Uh, one, Section 1983 provides attorney's fees awards. If you went to state court, you didn't get attorney's fees if you won your case. That made it harder to get a lawyer willing to take your case uh, because landlords didn't have to have lots of money. Now, it's a constitutional claim, so rights claim to Section 93, lawyers are much more willing to bring these cases because they have guaranteed attorney's fees not from their client but from the federal government. Second, under Section 93, you can get punitive damages, not just compensatory not just just compensation, potentially punitive damages. So the concern is this will have a major chilling effect on state and local governments' willingness to impose environmental restrictions because whether something's a taking or not is not always so obvious. Uh, it's really difficult, and so if you're worried as a local government that you might find a taking and you're worried about punitive damages uh, and you also get attorney's fees against you, um, people are worried it's going to chill a lot of uh, willingness of state and local officials to impose uh, needed environmental restrictions. This is not a shot of a Virginia uranium mine. It is a shot of Arizona, but it has this wonderful sign, so it's uh, on the slide. Uh, in Virginia uranium mining, the Fourth Circuit had upheld a Virginia state ban on uranium mining against a challenge arguing that the ban was preempted by the Atomic Energy Act, which reserves to the federal <coughs> government the power to regulate radiation safety, so the nuclear or radiation aspects of civilian nuclear power. Uh, the uh, Supreme Court in this case, uh, six to three voted to affirm the Fourth Circuit. In other words, the Virginia uranium ban survives and is not preempted. But it was a very divided court with three separate opinions, uh, and the court disagreed, the justices disagreed about the extent to which the state's motive in adopting the ban, the state's motive in adopting legislation is relevant to a preemption analysis. So the petitioners here own the largest uranium deposit in the United States in the perfectly named Pennsylvania County in Virginia, although it's named after a guy named William Pitt who was an early founder and was a former prime minister. I looked it up in Britain. It's actually not about mining in any sense. But they own this huge uranium deposit, and they want to develop it. And they're challenging this 1983 statute imposing a moratorium on mining. Um, the Atomic Energy Act does, in fact, preclude states from regulating matters of radiation safety. But there's a savings clause in it. And the savings clause allows states to regulate for other purposes. Now, to understand this, you need to know just a few things about mining uranium, so bear with me. For, there are three stages. One is the actual physical mining. The second is what's called milling, which is the means by which you extract yellow cake. Remember yellow cake from Niger? Yellow cake from the, uh, from the ore, and then you separate that from the waste, which is called tailings, which you then dispose of. Step two and three, which is the milling and the disposal of the tailings, are, in fact, under the jurisdiction of the Atomic Energy Act go to the federal government because they have to do with radiological safety and risk. The first step, which is the physical mining, has always been within the domain of the state. And all the justices agree about that, that mining on private land has always been uh, in the domain of the state. On its face, the Fourth Circuit said, the moratorium on mining uh, is uh, not preempted. It only applies to mining. Uh, and the petitioners objected and said, wait a minute, actually there's, there's evidence of impermissible motive here in the record. We can show you that the state really was concerned about safety and was trying to prevent um, uh, uh, you know, the, the development of nuclear power, was worried about the radiological risk, and they admitted as much in the mo at the motion to dismiss stage. This was all highly contested. And counsel for petitioners was peppered uh, when he, in oral argument, when the justices said, well, how, how should we do this inquiry into legislative motive? How should we ask what the state intended here? What are the limits on uh, our inquiry into motive? How do we develop a workable standard? What if the same statute was passed in two different states, one with a bad motive, one with a pure motive, and the exact same statute were struck down in one and upheld in the other? There was a lot of interest in how do we factor in a state purpose here? 
The U.S. was asked, the Solicitor General was asked to file a brief to weigh in uh, with the view of the United States, and the Solicitor General uh, did weigh in on the side of the private landowners, arguing for preemption. Uh, Solicitor General Francisco actually argued the case. Um, and uh, the court was, uh, as I mentioned, divided. So there was a lead opinion by Justice Gorsuch for two other justices joining this, uh, Justices Thomas and Kavanaugh, that said, purpose is always irrelevant. Uh, we don't want to look at state purpose. There are bad implications for state sovereignty if we inquire into legislative purpose. On its face, this affects mining. That's state domain. It's not preempted. In a concurring opinion, however, Justice Ginsburg, writing for both Kagan and Sotomayor, said that goes too far. Uh, that just uh, is sweeps too broadly. Uh, I don't, I, we concur in the judgment. This isn't preempted. But we don't agree with this idea that purpose is never relevant. So they reject the hardline view of the Gorsuch opinion. And dissenting, uh, the Chief Justice writing now for Breyer and Alito uh, said, no, purpose is relevant. And in fact, uh, the state has to answer uh, uh, with a non-safety rationale uh, when a pretext for their moratorium has been alleged. So there's preemption here. So uh, there's disagreement on the court about the role of purpose in preemption challenges. So I'm going to talk about the Juliana case. Uh, this was a case that was before the court on, on sort of jurisdictional issues last year. It was not a case which was granted and, and heard on the merits. This is a pretty famous case, which is why we decided to include it. This is our children's trust litigation. Uh, it brings a very bold federal constitutional claim. It was first brought against the Obama uh, administration. Uh, and the basic claim is the United States has violated the constitutional rights of, of the children of future generations by creating, controlling, perpetuating uh, a fossil fuel-based energy system. Uh, and by doing that, knowing for a long time uh, about the environmental destruction that would result uh, from that use of fossil fuels. Um, basic claim is there's a uh, due process right to a stable uh, climate system. Uh, now, they seek as a remedy uh, the, for the court to order a national remedial plan to phase out fossil fuels. Now, the trial court in Oregon uh, denied a motion to dismiss uh, filed by the federal government uh, now more than, a, more than a couple years ago. Uh, and the government's argument basically was there's no such due process right. Uh, the court denied that and basically said, we're going to have a trial. Um, and this was dubbed the trial of the century. Uh, it was going to be a 50-day trial. They had about a year of discovery. Um, and the United States repeatedly tried to get the district court to certify this for interlocutory appeal. Um, to get, let the Ninth Circuit hear it uh, on the merits, and the district court refused to certify it for interlocutory uh, appeal. The Ninth Circuit refused several times to issue a, a writ of mandamus uh, to basically force the appeal up, a very hard standard to get a writ of mandamus. And the United States went through discovery. As the trial date loomed larger uh, in October 2018, they got increasingly frustrated with the court's refusal to allow them to appeal this thing. They didn't want a 50-day uh, trial. Uh, putting the federal government on trial for this. They thought there was no underlying merit to the constitutional claim. Uh, so they finally went uh, to the United States Supreme Court uh, to try to get the U.S. Supreme Court to issue a writ of mandamus to allow them to ha argue that there was no such uh, due process right. Um, the Supreme Court in July 2018 denied uh, the, the request. Uh, but you have to read the court's language really carefully to understand what the court was doing. Uh, the court denied it, but they said without prejudice, and they said, the breadth of respondent's claim is striking, however. That's the constitutional claim. And the justiciability of these claims presents substantial grounds for difference of opinion. The district court should take these concerns into account. Well, if you know anything about the standard for interlocutory appeal, the court stated it. Uh, and that is substantial grounds for difference of opinion. So the court has basically said, grant the request for interlocutory appeal. We don't want to do writs of mandamus with the Supreme Court. We don't do that sort of thing. Grant the writ. Uh, the district court refused to grant uh, the writ. Uh, the, in, the, or, in Oregon. In Oregon. Uh, it's brought in Eugene, Oregon. Uh, they refused to grant uh, the writ. Uh, the Ninth Circuit refused to disturb it. Uh, and the trial was about to happen in October 2018. Uh, and so the United States uh, sought relief uh, from uh, the first the circuit justice, that's the chief justice, he ordered the discovery and trial be stayed. Uh, he did that uh, 19th, about a week or so before the trial was about to happen, while he sent it to the whole court. Uh, then went to the whole court, uh, and the court once again 
did not uh, agree to do a writ of, of mandamus or to hear the case on the merits itself, uh, although Justice Thomas and Gorsuch would do it. Instead, the court said, basically, we don't have to grant this writ, but here's why. We don't have to because the Ninth Circuit has twice denied the request for mandamus relief, and the court's base for denying relief, and they list the reasons, are to a large extent no longer pertinent. In other words, they're saying, grant the writ of mandamus. The reasons you gave before are no longer pertinent. Grant the writ. Don't make us do this. So we're not going to do it. This was obviously a compromise done between the chief and Breyer and Kagan, having not had the Supreme Court intervene and give them one more chance to clean this up and let the US have their appeal. Um, so they issued this, and lo and behold, uh, the district court judge uh, gave a writ, uh, sorry, certified it for interlocutory appeal. My guess is the chief judge of the Ninth Circuit called her on the phone and said, grant this thing. Don't make us issue a mandamus. She did. Uh, it was actually heard oral argument uh, last June before the Ninth Circuit. Actually, one Ninth Circuit judge, Michelle Friedland, refused to approve the, uh, the interlocutory appeal because she said she didn't think the district court judge really believed it. Uh, just did it because she was forced to. Um, but they did hear oral argument uh, in June. Everyone's waiting to see what the court does on whether there's such a whether there's standing uh, in this case or whether there's a due process claim. Uh, this is one I have to say that those of folks who are out there who care a lot about climate change and the role of courts in climate change, uh, you should worry about this case. Um, you may not want Ninth Circuit to rule in favor of the plaintiffs in this case. Um, if they rule in favor of the plaintiffs, the Supreme Court's going to take this case. Uh, and it's quite clear what they're going to do with this case. Uh, it's not going to be good law. Uh, it's not going to be good law on the due process claim. That would probably lose uh, by overwhelming majorities. But that real issue is on Article III standing. Uh, and this case, with the order of relief they're kind of seeking, is, could be really raw meat uh, for uh, a lot of the justices on the court. It would not be a pretty sight. Uh, so one has to be careful what one wishes for in this litigation. That brings us to two very important cases from last term. Uh, one is Kaisor, and the other is Gundy. And they're both uh, administrative law cases that have the potential for significant impacts in environmental law, as so many important administrative law cases do. And I want to talk about them. Uh, first, I'll talk about them individually, but I will get to talking about them together, because I think their joint impact is potentially quite profound. And it's not all good news. Uh, by any stretch for environmental law. Both of these cases upheld, in, in the broadest brush, both of them upheld, uh, maintained long-standing administrative law principles, and yet they did so barely uh, in a way that shows that these long-standing principles are under considerable strain in the Supreme Court. So let me describe what happened in each of these cases and then come back to their joint impact. Uh, in Kaiser, uh, the Supreme Court upheld five to four the doctrine of our deference, which those of you who have taken administrative law or even just legislation and regulation will recognize, is the doctrine that says that courts should defer to agency interpretations of their own ambiguous regulations providing they are reasonable. So it's like Chevron for agency rules. Um, there was a lot of consternation about the evolution of this doctrine. There was growing interest among justices on the Supreme Court, as well as in academia, about having another look at this doctrine. It all started with our own Dean John Manning, who wrote an article years ago in the 1990s saying, you know, this concept of our deference, ours the name of the case, um, of our deference is troubling because it creates bad incentives for agencies to actually write vague rules to give themselves the opportunity to then later interpret them in a way that they prefer without bothering to go through notice and comment. And that's a bad idea. And this was taken up by the justice for whom uh, John Manning clerk, Justice Scalia, who unfortunately himself had written our, but had come to, recon <laughs> come to reconsider it. And uh, there began to be a drumbeat calling for reconsideration that was joined by not just um, other justices on the Supreme Court, but other soon to be uh, justices on the Supreme Court, like Justice Gorsuch in his time on the um, 10th Circuit, and Justice Kavanaugh on the DC Circuit, all intimating that this doctrine would be something they'd like uh, very much to revisit. What's interesting is that this case involves a veterans appeal process that actually aren't great, doesn't give great facts for overturning our. This involved a veteran, uh, Kaiser, who had applied for benefits for having PTSD. 
His initial application was turned down uh, by um, the uh, Veterans Administration, but he came back and reapplied, and they did grant it on, uh, on the reapplication. And they refused, however, to apply the benefits retroactively. Um, there is a rule that the Veterans Administration has uh, promulgated that says that benefits can be granted retroactively back to the date of your initial application, which may have been denied, but only where the applicant brings forward relevant evidence that wasn't available at the time. That's what the rule says. And um, Kaiser had produced new evidence that he was, in fact, involved in a particular battle. And the Veterans Administration said, well, evidence of being in the battle isn't relevant to our determination. We knew you were in the battle. The evidence has to pertain, be relevant to the question of whether you have PTSD. So that's our interpretation of what a relevant piece of new information is, interpreting their own regulation. And this then went up. So this is an adjudication, and it's a formal adjudication. So there's lots of process. It then gets appealed to an appeals body. Uh, a Veterans uh, Appeals Council, and then it goes outside to the federal district court. So it has been through the administrative process, uh, and at each stage they uphold uh, the decision of uh, the, the Veterans Administration. And they do this in the federal circuit court by reference to our deference. So the court invokes our deference and says, uh, we'll defer to the agency's reasonable interpretation of its own rule. So um, in this Case, Justice Kagan writes the opinion, which is 5-4, but it's even closer than 5-4. And the reason it's even closer is that only a plurality of the justices, only four justices, actually joined the part of Justice Kagan's opinion that defended our deference on the merits for the reasons that Justice Kagan articulated. It's actually a beneficial doctrine because agencies have expertise, because agencies are the authors of their own regulations, because sometimes they're making policy decisions. There are a whole variety of reasons why you might support our deference. None of those attracted the fifth vote. The fifth vote came from the Chief Justice, who signed on to the opinion only to support its comments about stare decisis being important. So he voted to uphold our deference uh, out of respect for stare decisis. And then the chief also joined the part of the opinion in which Justice Kagan goes through a laundry list of uh, reasons why our is, in fact, very narrow and is highly constrained and very cabined. And basically, almost never will a court necessarily have to find itself deferring to an agency's interpretation of its own regulation. So she goes on to say that for our deference to apply, the regulation really has to be ambiguous. And the court really has to make an effort to interpret what the rule means all by itself using tools of statutory construction. And the agency, uh, when it issues its own view of its rule, has to make sure it's its official considered position. And the agency's interpretation has to implicate expertise. And on and on it goes. All of these factors uh, have been articulated in prior Supreme Court cases cabining our. But now they're put together in a very powerful statement that says it's a highly constrained doctrine of deference. Um, the um, uh, concurrence by Justice Gorsuch here uh, um, is scathing. In fact, all nine justices agree to send this back uh, to the Federal Circuit. Uh, they want the Federal Circuit to ask again whether this is really a case involving it's appropriate for our deference. But Gorsuch in his concurrence uh, basic, basically says uh, this doctrine, uh, its days are numbered. It has no business. Uh, uh, being upheld by the court. Um, this, uh, we should have said goodbye to it uh, in this instance. Um, the court has invented it. Uh, we ought to abandon it. And it's interesting because it is full of language about the great courage that is necessary to confront uh, this doctrine and finally jettison it. And it all but accuses the Chief Justice of you know, not really manning up. It says that you, know, you need to, you need to uh, have the courage of your convictions. Um, you need to be brave and bold enough to confront this doctrine uh, and overturn it. And he says that what the majority has done here is impose so many nebulous qualifications. Uh, they've enfeebled it. They've zombified it. They might as well uh, just kill it dead. There is a visceral opposition to judicial deference to agencies uh, at the heart of this uh, concurrence. Um, and a kind of disillusionment with the administrative state that we have seen in other uh, Gorsuch opinions. Um, why does this matter? The Chief Justice took pains to say 
yes, I voted to uphold this on stare decisis grounds, but I think the distance between Justice Kagan with her highly constrained, highly cabined view of when our deference is appropriate and Gorsuch's uh, concurrence is not very great. And by the way, he and Kavanaugh wrote separately to do the same thing, said, this has nothing to do with Chevron. We're not making a comment about Chevron deference, which is different. That's about deference to agency interpretation of statutes. We're not talking about that, which was interesting. The second and related case this term uh, that was another blockbuster administrative law case is Gundy. Uh, in Gundy, the Supreme Court, Court upholds a sex offender registration law against a non-delegation challenge. Uh, what's interesting about this case, we were talking about just before we came out here, um, this case was argued very early last term in October, and it took forever. The court heard it before Justice Kavanaugh was confirmed, so it was an eight-person court at the time, and finally issued the opinion uh, late in the term. And it comes out five to three, and I'm going to explain to you why that long delay is relevant in a moment, and we may want to speculate about it. Um, this is also closer than five to three. So this is another Justice Kagan opinion, writing for five justices. This time it is Justice Alito playing the chief's role from Kaiser. Justice Alito is uh, supplying the fifth vote to uphold the sex offender registration law against this non-delegation challenge to it. And he does so on stare decisis grounds. So there's only a plurality of the court wanting to uphold the statute against the non-delegation challenge. Uh, for anything other than stare decisis reasons. And it's important to know here what this statute said, because what was at issue here was whether a doctrine that says you can't delegate legislative power to agencies, unbridled, unconstrained legislative power, a doctrine that had been uh, uh, in desuetude for 85 years, as Cass Sunstein once famously wrote, you know, the non-delegation doctrine had one good year, and it was 1935 when Schechter Poultry and Panama Refining struck down statutes, and it's been quite dormant since then. The idea that this doctrine would be resurrected uh, could be profound. We might see many statutes struck down. It could be a real uh, uh, impingement upon the modern regulatory state. So a lot is at stake in this case, and what the sex offender registration uh, Act said here, it's a uh, statute called SORNA, that's the acronym, it calls for the Attorney General to specify the applicability, to specify the applicability of the registration requirement for sex offenders who had been convicted of their offenses before the passage of that act. Some people read that to suggest that the Attorney General decides whether those offenders convicted before this law was passed must register at all. Another way to read it is that the Attorney General must just specify when and uh, at what pace to deal with a backlog and to basically ad administer the problem of registration. So uh, Justice uh, Kagan writing for the plurality plus getting the vote from Alito on stare decisis grounds interprets this language that the AG should specify the applicability of the registration requirement, not as delegating to the executive branch whether the offenders are covered and must register, but how to register them. So through some interpretive jujitsu that calls on context and purpose and text, uh, Justice Kagan arrives at an interpretation that says, the AG does not have unconstrained discretion here. Uh, these offenders already must register as a function of the statute, and all the AG has to do is manage that registration process. Mr. Gundy himself had failed to register upon his release. He'd been convicted of raping a minor. He was released, had failed to register in the state of New York, uh, and uh, uh, was subject to criminal prosecution for failing uh, to register. In this instance, um, Justice Kagan, having construed the act to confer only the question of how to administer the registration, uh, says this easily passes constitutional muster. This doesn't come close to violating the non-delegation doctrine. We've upheld lots of statutes of this kind, and there is an intelligible principle here that guides the exercise of discretion, which is a notion of feasibility. You want to implement the registration requirements on pre-act offenders in a feasible way uh, to the extent that you can. Um, in this instance, uh, the dissent, which is uh, a dissent, uh, pardon me, first I'll speak to Alito's concurrence. Alito uh, says, um, we've been upholding statutes like this for many years, so I'm going to join to affirm, but I'm ready to roll if there are four other justices who want to overturn uh, statutes based on non-delegation challenges. I would support that effort if we had five votes. 
What we were discussing before we came out here is, and this goes back to why did this case take so long, it was argued and then it laid uh, there for months and months and months, while Kavanaugh was in fact sworn in, they could have had five votes. Why might they not have? Uh, well, they, they could have because they could have just scheduled for re-argument. Uh, the Nick case was argued this same week in October uh, before Kavanaugh got there. Uh, they clearly divided four to four on it and they scheduled for re-argument in January. Uh, they could have done exactly the same thing in this case, get a reschedule for oral argument. In, in January, and they would have had five votes. Uh, we get to Q&A. We're running out of time. We get to Q&A. I'll okay. answer why. Um, the Gore, I, I go on at length about these two administrative cases because I think they're quite important. Uh, I just mentioned the Gorsuch dissent uh, here again, scathing, 33 pages long, nearly twice as long as Kagan's opinion, joined by Ju uh, Chief Justice Roberts and Thomas, uh, basically an energetic exegesis on the non-delegation doctrine, the history of why it should be resurrected uh, and applied. And uh, what's important to note here is that we have two justices who are playing polar opposites role. They're in a vociferous debate. Justice Kagan is upholding uh, and standing by these long established administrative law principles of deference on the one hand and uh, delegation on the other, whereas Justice Gorsuch uh, is uh, champing at the bit. Uh, to unravel these long-standing administrative principles. They have very different views about the administrative state. Both these cases were closer than the numbers uh, would suggest. Um, and what we have here is two decisions to retain the status quo extremely narrowly. But they both express the ascendance of uh, a very grumpy perspective about the behemoth that is the federal government. And they want to restore, the, the impetus here is to restore the rightful place of the judiciary in the constitutional order. Judges should decide what the law is, not defer to agencies. And this is very significant for environmental law for the following reason. This field, like many others, but especially this field, relies on a robust sense uh, of executive regulatory power uh, and independent agency expertise along with executive branch expertise. And there's a need to uh, accept some flexibility for agencies to deal with new problems under old statutes. All of that, that perspective is not being embraced by this uh, sort of movement on the Supreme Court. Kagan, on the one hand, is defending the old order, uh, but she's under terrific pressure from uh, the Gorsuch uh, group. And I think this uh, portends some serious implications for the field of environmental law. All right, I'm going to try uh, uh, to do uh, some 2019 cases uh, fairly quickly. Uh, these are the two cases the court has granted on the merits versus the County of Maui versus Hawaii Wildlife Fund. Uh, and here are the relevant facts. The County of Maui engages in, in deep water, deep well injection uh, of sewage from its uh, sewage treatment plant. Uh, the sewage treatment plant you see is about point half a mile uh, from the Pacific Ocean, and they inject three to five million gallons of sewage a day. Uh, and it goes down in the ground, and then not very quick, long after that, it goes right into the Pacific Ocean. Uh, and the question is whether they're subject to Section 402 of the Clean Water Act, which requires permits for discharge in the navigable waters of the United States. And there's no question that what comes out goes down as sort of a discharge in some sense, it's a discrete conveyance. There's no question ends up in the navigable water of the United States, and that's the Pacific Ocean. The question is whether or not, because uh, it goes through groundwater in between, uh, that takes it outside of the scope uh, of, the, of the Clean Water Act. Uh, um, so this is a big case for the Clean Water Act. There are about 30 amicus briefs filed on, on different sides uh, of this case. Um, the county says this is clearly a discharge. Uh, you're, putting, you know, you're putting in through a discrete conveyance. Yes, it's going through groundwater, but then it's going right there. It's going right into the Pacific Ocean. Uh, and then the other side says, no, no, it's going to groundwater. And groundwater is not an avid water of the United States. Uh, and that's clear, too. So um, they're saying it's not, and the county's saying it's not, and the environmentalists are saying absolutely. Uh, if you take something, you take a cannon, and you shoot it in the air, and it lands right in that water, it may go through the air, and the clean water doesn't radiate the air, but it's still, it's a discrete command, it's right in. If that goes through water, uh, Niagara waters and groundwater makes no difference at all. Uh, the EPA was originally on the side of the environmentalists in the Ninth Circuit, uh, and then in the Supreme Court they switched sides, and they're now on the side uh, of, of the county. Uh, so how, uh, how do I think this case is going to come out? Um, uh, the environmentalists have some headwind here. Whenever the court takes a case, uh, they almost always rule uh, for the petitioners rather than the respondents, so they've got some headwind. Um, but they've done a good job in the briefing. There's very good briefing here. The way they can win this case is persuade the court 
that there is a viable limiting principle. They're not saying that every time you've got wa something that comes out ends up in navigable waters, that always is covered. Uh, and they've been, they basically su suggested a proximate cause test, like out of tort law. They say, well, it depends on how proximate it is over time and space. Not saying it always does, it's limited, it's a proximate cause, and this clearly satisfies uh, proximate cause. That could be a winning argument. It just depends on whether they can get five votes for it. Uh, ironically, the uh, swing vote here may well be someone like Justice Gorsuch. Uh, he can be quite a literalist. Uh, you can look at the language of the statute. Uh, it's whether any addition of any pollutant in the Agua waters. There's some language in a prior opinion written by Justice Scalia in that Rapanos case, which would actually suggest in dicta that this kind of thing would be covered by the act, so we'll have to see what Justice Gorsuch uh, is willing to do. The extra twist in this case, it's scheduled for oral argument, you see on November 6th, uh, is that it might not happen. Um, the, the county uh, has recently voted to settle this case. Uh, they're under enormous pressure from environmentalists. They say, do you really want to be the party that gets the Supreme Court to endorse a reading of the Clean Water Act, which makes it harder for you and other governments to protect the waters of the United States? So the county is actually rethinking whether they actually want to be in this case or not. Uh, so the, uh, they've actually recently voted to settle the case. Efforts have been all the time in the Supreme Court, often to kill cases. It's not unusual. So it may get killed. It may go away uh, between now and then. Uh, the next case is a case called Atlantic Richfield Company v. Uh, Gregory Christian. This is a Superfund case, hazardous waste case, comprehensive environmental response, compensation, liability act case. Here are the relevant facts. From 1884 to 1977, the Anaconda Copper Company engaged in massive uh, uh, mining, copper mining, uh, in Butte, Montana. Uh, tens, tons of, uh, tens of millions of copper oil, uh, 10,000 miles uh, uh, beneath the city of Butte, and there's one in the Butte which is 1.5 miles across and 1,800 feet deep. Uh, now, in their wisdom, Atlantic Richfield Company bought uh, the Anaconda Copper uh, for $700 million in 1977, and then they had to close it three years later because of all the hazardous waste there. This was not a smart deal on their part to buy this copper company. They had to close it a few years later, and they've had to spend hundreds of millions of dollars in cleaning uh, this thing up since then under EPA orders under the Superfund statute. Uh, so the question in the case uh, relates to the fact that Montana has a state law uh, which allows somebody to bring a claim for restoration damages caused by hazardous waste. And those restoration damages then go to clean up the site. So the plaintiffs here brought an action under Montana law saying, we want you, uh, Atlantic Rift Fuel, to give us more money, which that money then goes into a pot which goes to more cleanup. And the question is whether that's preempted by federal law or not. Um, and if, they all, if the restoration damages went into the pocket of the people injured, there'd be no preemption. It's only because it's designated to clean up the site. And the Superfund statute was written, in a way, with very harsh preemptive provisions. Because the time Congress wrote this in 1980, they were very worried about people trying to interfere with EPA cleanups. They didn't want industry to be able to challenge cleanups. They didn't want environmentalists to challenge cleanups. Because they wanted these cleanups done as quickly as possible, and as fast as possible, and not get tied up in years of litigation. Because the sites are dynamic. They're not passive. And the longer it takes to clean it up, the more damage it happens. So the statute is riddled with provisions, which is sort of to make it harder. One is 113H, which says no federal court has jurisdiction to consider any challenges to any to cleanup efforts done, ordered by the EPA. Um, so the question in this case is whether or not CERCLA, the Superfund statute, preempts this state law when the damages go to cleanup uh, or not. And 113H seems to govern, except this is a case brought in state court. And it's written only in terms of federal court. Uh, so they have to argue, well, but it's the same policy would apply to state court. Uh, the other hurdle in the case is that the CERCLA has a provision, like almost all of federal environmental law, preserving state law generally, saying we don't actually mean to preempt state law. Uh, so you have to have tension between those provisions, uh, and we'll have to see uh, what will happen uh, in the case. The case is set for argument on December 3rd. Things to look for in this case. This case can have broader significance beyond uh, this. If the court reads the savings provision that saves state law in a way which reads it very narrowly, that will hurt all those state nuisance litigation cases currently being brought on climate. So people are paying a lot of attention to what the court says of the meaning of this provision here, because that's very much like the meaning of the language in the Clean Air Act. 
So if they read that narrowly, that's going to affect those state nuisance uh, cases. Uh, so people paying a lot of attention uh, to that. Uh, the government here, though, is unlikely to get Chevron uh, deference, but we'll get to that in another moment. Here's the other thing to look for in the case. This is being argued uh, by petitioners by Lisa Blatt. Uh, Lisa Blatt is an attorney with Williams and Connolly. Uh, Lisa is famously one of the single most aggressive Supreme Court advocates in the country. Uh, so I guarantee you, it'll be well worth reading the transcript afterwards or listening to the audio. Here's Lisa Blatt in her own words, her philosophy uh, about Supreme Court argument. Advocates of both an art and a war don't think about what the law should be or what the law is. Don't be professorial. The only point is to win. Uh, or even better, this is going to sound awful, but I do think of every case like this. One side is actually going to die, and I don't want it to be me. Um, she has a different attitude than most of us who appear before the court. She's very successful. Um, just briefly before we close, and, and I think we're both happy to stay and take questions, even if some of you have to leave at the formal end, because um, I think there's a lot to discuss, and we're happy to uh, stay behind. But we just wanted to say a few words about Justice Stevens, uh, who passed away at the age of 99 this past July. He served on the court from 1975 to 2010. Uh, he served under multiple chief justices, Justices Berger, Rehnquist, and Roberts. He, had, he was unanimously confirmed to the court something unthinkable in the modern day. Um, he was the last member of the court to serve in World War II. He was a dedicated Cubs fan, an avid tennis player. Um, he, he was the politest uh, justice, he would say, may I ask? And advocates would always remark on the fact that he was so polite, just as he was asking the one question that would skewer their case. Um, <laughs> he had deep Midwestern roots, uh, kind, humble, friendly, courteous. Uh, everybody said these things about Justice Stevens. And we want to make a special note of him in particular because he leaves behind uh, an enormous uh, and powerful environmental legacy. Um, he is the author, of course, of the majority opinion in Massachusetts versus EPA and managed to corral uh, Justice Kennedy's vote for a 5-4 uh, decision that held greenhouse gases regulable under the Clean Air Act. Some people on this panel have written a book about that case. Um, and uh, it's a remarkable opinion, and uh, he will rightly go down in history for it. He also is the author of the famous Chevron case, a case that was actually a loss for the environmental side, if you go back and review it, uh, but which now, of course, the environmental groups and advocates cling to uh, as a principle uh, of deference to agency discretion. He also wrote very powerful and important dissents in cases like Rapanos, the Clean Water Act jurisdiction case, and cases like Swank. It's not like uh, the environmentalists always won, uh, uh, with, uh, always got his vote. Um, he did write some opinions uh, that curtailed environmental regulation, uh, famously the Robertson versus Methow Valley NEPA case. There are lots of examples like this. But he was a powerful voice. Um, he wasn't ideological. He was pragmatic. Um, the idea of deferring to agency expertise was something, the openness to agency expertise was something that Justice Stevens uh, had uh, a great deal of, some empathy for the agency, sympathy for the agency, a willingness to listen, uh, and an openness to applying laws to new realities. And I think his voice on the court is something uh, we're all going to miss. Um, he was quite a figure. Yeah, I mean, absolutely deeply missed. Uh, just a wonderful justice, a wonderful human being. I think of two more cases, all the regulatory takings cases. Yeah, the Tahoe Sierra Preservation Council case. Uh, he was always uh, very aggressively uh, supportive of environmental regulation. And of course, the Endangered Species Act, the Babbitt v. Sweet Home yes. uh, case, one of the most significant uh, sort of wildlife protection uh, cases. Again, corralling a, a good majority uh, there. As so Jody said, very much missed. We will miss him. So with that, we'd be happy to take questions. And again, some of you may need to leave, but we're happy to keep rolling. I wrote you a note once. Yes, I know. <laughs> Hello. I was going to just hand it to you. Actually, I could have, I could have clicked. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. My question is, what is the story with Justice Kavanaugh? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Let, I, let's repeat that so people watching. So the, the, the question is, uh, why didn't the court uh, basically set for re-argument uh, the Gundy case? I mean, here it was. Nick and Gundy were argued basically at the same time, the beginning of October. Um, both of them, they clearly didn't have a majority. 
for it. So they reset for argument in the Nick case. So Kavanaugh could produce it, and they had a five to overrule. And they didn't reset for argument the Gundy case. Um, and then Justice Leto writes a separate current opinion saying, if we had a majority to reconsider, I'd be there. You're going to go, well, yeah. actually, there's another justice who's, you could have set this argument and you could have done it. Uh, no one knows for sure. Uh, the one speculation which I've heard, which is a pretty interesting uh, speculation, which is why Jody's trying to goad me to say it, and that's why I'm a professor with tenure, so I can say it, um, <laughs> is that uh, the, the, the issue is non-delegation. It occurred in the context of a sex offender statute. Uh, and there's some suggestion that maybe the court uh, didn't want to decide this issue uh, in the sex offender context. Uh, and they may have had a particular reason not to want to put on the spot uh, one justice to be the deciding vote uh, in that context. So they're waiting for another day. But remember how big a deal this is. The fact that they didn't rehear this and have a full court to decide a non-delegation challenge where you could have had the first time in 85 years of striking down a federal statute on non-delegation grounds, and you have a justice in, um, a, a, a agreeing, you know, con in uh, concurring uh, simply on stare decisis, is a, it, it's and amazing. Say, it's and amazing. not more on stare decisis, saying, yeah. I would be there yeah. to reconsider if the majority were yeah. here. And you're going, yeah, but yeah. we actually have reason to think that Justice Kavanaugh, the D.C. Circuit judge, was fairly outspoken on these kinds of issues. And the other thing is the Chief Justice, remember, in the Kaiser case uh, was a break. He was the fifth vote in Kaiser for upholding our deference. Like, let's not go to the sweeping uh, place that uh, Justice Gorsuch wants us to go. He was not playing that role in the Gundy case. Right? He, he dissented. dissented. He dissented. So this, this dynamic is very interesting. And, and uh, uh, I just would say, look, I don't think this was a great term for environmental law. I think there are people who are walking away from this term saying, well, the frog lived to fight another day, and the Alaska case is just about Alaska, and hey, the uranium mining ban is upheld, and you know, these two administrative law cases, well, uh, you know, the Kagan side of things uh, helped in the, these doctrines survive. I think you look a little closer, and it's much shakier, uh, much shakier yeah, than that. It's, it's a term that uh, not that much happened, but a lot seems to be brewing, uh, not far beneath the landscape. Perfect. Do we have one more question from the side? Or anyone from the side? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Uh, so do you foresee, uh, so potentially there's going to be challenges uh, to regulatory rollbacks that are currently happening, um, one of which would be really contentious would be the California waiver, uh, revoking the waiver. Um, do you foresee that as a potentially good context in which agency deference, uh, court deference to agencies might be challenged? Well, I can tell, <laughs> I can tell you what I think um, the government will probably not do, which is make Chevron arguments uh, front and center. Uh, because they seem to be uh, disappearing. Uh, Chevron seems to be uh, dying a death of disuse. Um, uh, but I, I, I do think that uh, the challenge to the Trump administration's revocation of California's waiver raises all these interesting questions of federalism. And some of us are thinking about the uranium mining case and wondering if the court's latest pronouncement on preemption will tell us something about how they might rule in that case, which of course is a case about preemption. The, the problem is, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but we can all talk privately later, but the case in which California is being preempted under the Trump administration's theory of another federal law, basically you know, blocking California, is not really the same as the Virginia uranium case, which concerns this core area of state competence <coughs> to regulate mining. This case instead, the California case, concerns regulating air pollution from cars, which the claim is belongs to the federal government for good reason. So it's not really parallel. And there was a strong announcement in you know, the Virginia uranium case in support of state sovereignty and federalism. And that, you could think, superficially is good for California. But I think once you dig beneath the superficial appearance, it, it doesn't help out that much. So I think this is a real, this is going to be a hornet's nest, a real open question. All right, thank you all so much. Um, this has obviously been a busy year for the Supreme Court, and as you've learned from our fantastic panelists today, there's quite a bit more on the horizon.
the first Monday of October, the formal close of the October 2018 term is just on the horizon, um, as is the October 29 opening. So thank you both term panelists. Thank you so much to our audience for joining us today, both here in the room as well as online. If you have great questions, I'm sure you might have one moment to take more questions after the program concludes. Um, as you continue to think and watch the Supreme Court and the cases before it, um, I do want to just note that really the best that people that you could ask for any of these questions are right in front of you. And we're so grateful to both of them for their leadership on today's program. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.